Hello and welcome to Electric Sheep, episode 8, the Delayed by Snow edition. Um, <laughs> in the studio with me uh, are Paul Andrews Hello. and Elizabeth Jones. Hello. And my name is Carl Sykes. Um, as usual, we're going to do our kind of round robin to start off with of what people have been using or may have discovered that they want to talk about this week. So um, I think this week we'll, we'll mix things up a bit and start with Paul. And I'll say, Paul, what have you been using this Ooh, week? Well, um, apart from being snowed in... Um, well, it's not really so much of what I've been using. It, it's it's more about um, I was lucky enough to be invited to uh, an event uh, up at the University of Glamorgan, right, um, on Wednesday, where I got to meet lots of lovely people, um, and they were talking about um, how they are using a Blackboard, which is another virtual learning environment um, over there, and they had uh, some guys from Blackboard come down and show us some of the features, and um, and it was really interesting because one of the things that they are uh, starting to do now with with Blackboard is that they, they want to move into a more kind of social networking aspect right okay um so what, what essentially what they were saying was that um certainly up at the university of morgan they've been using the technology for a number of years to put resources on for the students to you know access um and have discussion groups and all that kind of thing mm-hmm. but they, they're now going to have the facility certainly blackboard are offering the facility for students and academics to connect with one another in between different institutions Right, okay. So, for example, you could have, and we've got uh, uh, Phil joining us later who teaches psychology, you could have some psychology students, say, um, want to communicate with other students who are studying the same subject but who are perhaps in a different university, could be in a different part of the world, but they're able to do so via this new kind of social network within the Blackboard environment. So it's, it's almost like a walled garden, so it's safe and secure, but they can talk about you know, research or work that they're doing or anything like that. So, um, so yeah, it was just very interesting to see this kind of, um, not necessarily a new direction uh, for Blackboard, but certainly an additional string to its bow by that kind of acknowledging the power of people coming together and working together and sharing ideas. Right. And but is this is this something that's new to to Blackboard, or is it or is it something that's been there but but the people you've been working with are looking to use it for the first time? It's, um, well, I mean, basically, previously, uh, my understanding is Blackboard had a facility to have like kind of groups come together, but the ability to almost have this um, it, it's very like um, reminds me of AOL. Kind of, yeah. It's a, or or a bit, it's a bit like Google Plus uh, in that you can you know you, you have this profile with a photograph on, but uh, and then are able to connect with people, but across all of the institutions. Right. Um. So that so that that the notion of connecting up these the, the different instances of Blackboard, if you like, um, I believe is a is a is a new thing. So it was quite interesting to see how you know what they were doing with it and and how it might be adapted, um, in the classroom, outside the classroom, in in the lecture theatre, and so on. Okay, I've I've heard of uh, I've heard of something similar, uh, a kind of a a, a bit of a, you know something that's out there that, that connects higher education and education institutes. Um, it started off that way, certainly. I think it's called Facebook. But, uh, but no, yeah. no, I mean that's no, that's really useful. Yeah. Um, and and kind of is is this something that they're just using? Um, are they trying to get other institutions on board that they can work with, or is it something that kind of once it's once it's up and running, you, there are other people you can just instantly connect I think with? So. I mean, yeah. The, I mean, the main thing is, with, as with all these kind of social things, you need critical mass. Yes, of um, course. So I think it will it will live or die on the strength of the number of people that actually start to populate this environment and start to share, uh, you know, resources in this manner. Um, I think. Um, what I suspect it what will happen is it will be it will be it'll vary from department to department. Some people will have subjects that are that lend themselves to that kind of uh, communication. Other subjects, maybe not so much. So I think it's going to be um, probably a, there'll be a, a, a wide degree of kind of variance, if you like, um, between different departments that wanted to take it out. But it's right. certainly it's a nice feature to have. Um, I, mean, I know we've got Phil coming on later on because he, his students are within the University of Wales Newport, they're kind of already doing it. But like you say, they are using Facebook for that uh, kind of system where you know they've, they've set themselves up a little closed group and are able to talk to one another. But I think Blackboard's vision is very much a, a case of having this kind of uh, uh, network of interconnected institutions globally right? where everyone using that Blackboard system is able to kind of share ideas and resources or... You know, and I think that's really useful because, you know, a, a lot of times you'll find that there's not there's not even sort of communication within a single individual institute, mm. let alone between a number of universities um, in, in, in the UK or overseas. So yeah. to be able to kind of grab all those different institutions and, and bring them together to allow that sort of community of practice and sharing of ideas and opinions is 
potentially a really useful tool. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and I thought and we didn't really mention Blackboard that much because you know, University of Wales Newport, we aren't using Blackboard. So I just thought I'd kind of put it in there because I do know that some people who listen to this do use Blackboard. Um, so yeah. you know, if you are using Blackboard, it's, it's worth checking out. Fantastic. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so uh, moving on to to our uh, our sort of co presenter Elizabeth, and she's feeling a little bit poorly today, so Aww. do do bear with Liz if she if she stumbles along the way. I'm sure she won't. <laughs> oh, thank you. But Liz, um, what have you been kind of looking at this week or or, or working on, and, and kind of what have you got to to share with us? Um, well, this was something that came up in a discussion with somebody else in our department, uh, talking about a primary school that wanted an easy way of cataloguing what they called a room full of books that they wanted to turn into a library, which we pointed out a room full of books pretty much <laughs> is a library. library. <laughs> um, however, um, the thing that immediately sprang to mind was something called Library Thing. And everyone mm. thought I couldn't remember the name, but that is actually its name, <laughs> Library Thing. This, this Library com. Thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah LibraryThing.com. Um, and it allows you to pretty much catalogue your own personal collection of books and you can use right. it as an individual or as an institution or, um, you know, however you like. And uh, you can search for a book title or you can um, scan it in if you get a little mm -hmm. USB barcode scanner to attach to your computer um, and you can add books in and it will search Amazon, Library of Congress catalogue and hundreds and hundreds of other sources so it doesn't have to be like a really obvious book it can be something pretty obscure um, and it will search all these places find all the results and it doesn't just bring up you know the title and the author and that it, it brings up the full whack of like library cataloging mm. stuff including um, suggested cataloging numbers so right. in the library of congress system the dewey decimal system and some other um, official sort of library subject headings what were the like what were the um, primary school kind of wanting to use it for? I know you you kind of just said yeah. you know they've got a room full of books, but what what were they hoping to use this well, system for? They want to catalogue them purely to know what they've got, and then after that they were hoping to set up um, the library as a lending library that the children can run to teach right. them sort of responsibility and things. Um, so that that's something that library library thing doesn't really do. You could add in tags like borrowed and returned and things, mm -hmm. but that's not what that would be for but you could you can um, export the data that you've got from your sort of selection of books and use it for other things but if you've got a personal collection of books that you want to catalog then it's a really useful tool and then it can provide you with recommendations based on other users or right. even more specialized other users with similar libraries to you okay um and then there's uh you know, there's huge community things and people recommending books and other stuff it's not it, it's a lot like um, the way I, I've sort of described it. it. Reminds me of how people use Goodreads, like recommendations mm -hmm. and and what you're reading. But library thing is much more about the cataloging and organising and stuff of books. Whereas Goodreads is more social. Library thing came along a lot earlier than Goodreads did. Mm -hmm. It's been around for years. Um, whereas Goodreads is much more recent. It's more like the Facebook of books. Right. Okay. Library thing is. More of a library thing. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, none of our listeners can see this, but you know, Liz has got a little twinkle in her eye when she's talking about library thing. Because, of course, for those who've listened previously, know that Liz's background is as as a librarian. Yes. So uh, she does have a little twinkle in her eye <laughs> yes. of, of oh, good I love Goodreads too, as well. But yeah, any anything to do with books and libraries is going to make me a bit happy. Um, both of them are wonderful tools, and they mm. do actually sort of sit quite nicely with each other. With Goodreads, it's more about what you've read. Library things more about keeping it as a system. If you're a bit OCD, as all librarians are, yes. then it's a wonderful tool to use. Um, university libraries are actually using library thing as well. It's not just brilliant for personal use or for this very specific sort of primary school setting where it'll easily allow them to do something like this. There are um, libraries around the world, not actually not just university ones, where they'll use it not to catalogue their whole library, that would go a bit far, because they do have library catalogues, but to sort of demonstrate some of their collections, specific areas, um, and lots of them do it for new acquisitions. Mm, that's useful. So yeah. as the stuff's coming in, they'll have a list of, say, the hundred or so most recent acquisitions, and it'll bring up a cover view of all of them, and then you can look into the sort of recent stuff that they've acquired, what sort of subject it is, and, and that sort of thing. So if you're looking for books on a particular subject, you can have a look and see what's come in that's 
of a recent title of that. So it's it's really nice for libraries to demonstrate, you know, and promote a little bit of their collection. Oh, that's excellent. I mean, and, and and as always, we'll we'll put a link to that on mm-hmm. on the site. So um, you know, if you're interested in library thing, um, then by all means pop along and have a look and register. Um, it's free to register as far as I'm aware. Yeah, yep, very easy, and you can register with your Twitter or Facebook as well. Fantastic. Brilliant. So, yeah. But yeah. I also recommend Goodreads as well as a more social library uh, mm. book reading tool. Excellent. We'll put all the links on so our listeners can uh, get along and have a look and see what's out there. Excellent. So, <laughs> Mr Sykes, what have you been doing this week? Well, uh, what, what I wanted to talk about um, this week is something that I've actually um, stumbled across uh, via your Paul's e-learning um, mm-hmm. website. Um, I know you, you kind of regularly send out. It's nothing to worry about. It's nothing I shouldn't have stumbled Uh-oh. across. But um, no, uh, I know you kind of send send out a fairly regular update of yeah. new things that you've you come across. And one of the things that I've been looking at this week is um, a site that you you'd noted called MP3 Cut, yes, um, which yes. was which looks really useful. Essentially, what it allows you to do well, it allows you to do a couple of things. But the first thing it allows you to do is to take a pre-existing um, recording that mm. you've made. Um, upload it to their site and cut out a segment that you want to kind of isolate from a longer, larger um, mm-hmm. recording. And essentially what it let you do is cut the chunk out that you want to keep and then download it back as an MP3 recording. Yep. So essentially, uh, you know, for example, if, if this podcast is taken as an example, we could take a small snippet out of the overall recording that mm-hmm. we want to keep, um, download that as an MP3 recording and then maybe upload it to our virtual sure. learning environment or, or whatever else we want to do with it. Essentially it means you don't need complicated and expensive um, editing equipment or, or um, sorry, editing software that you might need to download from elsewhere. This is really quick and easy. Upload the piece of um, the track that you want to, to cut. Essentially, grab the piece you want and download that chunk straight back out the other end. And it's really quick and useful. The other thing it does do, and I'm not sure necessarily whether I should be promoting this bit <laughs> on the podcast. So, I'm just, but, but if you go to the site, you'll know about it. But what it will let you do also do is is to take um, a SoundCloud or, or um, YouTube uh, link to a, mm-hmm. an, an audio track. Um, Upload that to the site and and sort of isolate the segment of that yeah. you want, and again download that as MP3. Now we're not obviously recommended you go and get copyrighted material and cut chunks out. We no, wouldn't be but doing if it's that. Creative Commons, or absolutely. But if it's then... if it's out there and it's available yeah. to use, then of course that's another really useful tool, and mm. it means that people don't need to be knowledgeable about complicated software um and, and lots of these things are quite complicated to use if you don't have a background in kind of uh, you know sort of audio um recording or yeah, anything sure. else it, it can be quite complicated to know what you need to do mm. so this this really does take out all the all the difficult bits mm. and it's a couple of clicks and you've got your isolated segment that you can then go off and do what you need to do yeah. with so it's a really useful um little site the address is mp3cut.net okay. and again we'll put links to that yeah. up on the site but um it's just something there's not too much to say about it but it's something that i wanted to highlight because i think it's got really useful potential yeah. um and obviously the fact that you've picked it up for your site mm-hmm. means that you know it's yeah. obviously got no, something it's, about it's, it so. it's quite quick as well i mean the, the, the thing that appealed to me was always that kind of is it simple to use but is yes. it fast because I, I know a lot of the the fine folks we tend to work with they are quite time limited and yeah. it's got, like if something doesn't work in under 30 seconds for them they they can get a bit kind of like oh you know is it going to work i haven't got time for this whereas this is you're going to call it up and just a couple of clicks and and you're done absolutely absolutely and that's the thing you know what you want is you want to get your you want to get your small segment of audio track and you want to have it available to then do with whatever you've Mm. actually you know want to do with it so so yeah you're right it is it's quick it's very simple to use it's very very quick to get your output from from the site and and to be able to go off and then kind of do what you need to do with it so yeah definitely worth a look um and um you know you know the, the links are on there so do do have a look around and see if it's useful for you Okay, so now we're joined in the studio by Dr. Philip Morgan. Um, Phil, thanks for joining us. I'm going to call you Dr. Phil. Uh, <laughs> can I call you Dr. Phil? Um, you can call me anything you like. Brilliant. Um, yeah, Phil is fine. Yeah. Uh, Phil with two L. It's Phil not, with two L. It's not Phil. It's Phil. 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 Yeah, okay, Phil. lovely. So, um, Phil, you work for the University of Wales Newport. You're part of their psychology department. What are your kind of specialities within that department? What do you kind of... Um, Major on. I kind of regard myself as having sort of two main specialities, if you like. That was uh, part of the reason why I joined the university. So mainly my main role is lecturing and researching within my areas of expertise within psychology. Right. And those areas quite broadly are cognitive experimental psychology, which mm-hmm. looks at the human mind, thinking, memory, mm-hmm. problem solving, attention. Those okay. Things. 
uh, and human factor psychology, which is more concerned with psychology in the real world in workplace environments mm. and how we can um, draw upon psychological principles and research to inform, if you like, better design right. of workplace environments oh, and okay. how to sort of train people better there. So that's sort of one side of my role. I obviously lecture um, uh, within psychology on those subject areas yeah, uh, and on sort of research methods and statistics in general because mm -hmm. I have got quite a broad research background. Mm. Um, but my other role within psychology is also to look after the psycho uh, psychology laboratories. Right. Um, okay. So I... I, my official title is senior lecturer within psychology, but mm -hmm. also research lead for mm -hmm. psychology. So that involves looking after and developing, uh, further developing psychology resources within Newport. Uh, so laboratory facilities, testing equipment, um, software for running experiments, mm -hmm. um, and also uh, looking after some research technicians that we have working within psychology. Right, okay. um, and, and also developing things like sort of human participation panels and things like that for gotcha for our students and for staff to take part in experiments. Right. So I mean, when you say, I mean, you know, people aren't familiar maybe with psychology, you mentioned laboratory. People will tend to have a vision of, of a, uh, almost like a science lab, like Bunsen burners. And it really, it's not like that kind um, of laboratory, is it? It's, no, it's, it's, it's not like, it, it can be like that in some situations, but with the kind of applied, the applied uh, themed research that we do, um, a, a lot of work, that, when, when we say laboratory, a lot of work can be done outside of the laboratory, mm -hmm. of course, um, in psychology, where questionnaire designs observing people. Um, and doing all sorts of things like that. But when we say laboratory, we tend to mean um, a range of facilities, usually involving computers, right. computer screens, uh, people performing tasks on those computers. So mm. they could be uh, varying fidelity uh, tasks that sort of mimic uh, things that, that go on in the real world, like memory tasks, problem okay. solving. Yeah. You might actually be in a driving simulator performing an experiment where mm. somebody's measuring your attention to the road yeah. whilst you're driving in sort of snowy conditions, for example. Mm. And we might be able to manipulate that that computer experience and measure how people perform right, in that environment okay. on computers. We can even do things with the facilities that we have in the psychology labs, like uh, like track people's eyes. So we have mm -hmm. um, a very sophisticated piece of kit called um, an eye tracker, mm -hmm. uh, which we have in one of our laboratories, uh, which works by tracking the pupil movements yeah. of people's eyes whilst they're performing specific tasks. And then we can sort of make quite sensible and informed predictions about things like uh, encoding information where people are focusing, where they fluctuate their attention between things on screens. Right. Okay. So all sorts of, so it's not a lab, it's not Bunsen burners and white coats, mm -hmm. um, but we do have lots of other bits and pieces that we do have computers and we have a lot of sophisticated equipment like uh, high definition video cameras, eye, mm -hmm. eye trackers and, and things like that. So mm. it's not a traditional sort of chemistry biology lab. Yeah, but there are so things going on. There, are, there are things and, going on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Interesting things. Okay. I mean, as you know, I mean, uh, one of the main kind of focuses of this particular podcast is using uh, kind of technologies that are out there uh, that, people, that anyone listening to this can think, I want, I want to use that technology that will help me, you know, achieve whatever it is I want to achieve. So are there any things uh, like for your students in particular uh, that you think are useful to them if, if they want to engage in some kind of research activity uh, that they yeah. might be able to kind of absolutely play I, I think uh, one of, within the laboratory facilities we we have if um, students wanted to come and study at Newport for example mm -hmm. and uh, and study with us and, and and be involved in research there's obviously lots of things that we have there yeah uh, some of the things I described earlier like the computer equipment gotcha. trackers those kind of things but research within psychology is becoming a lot easier to conduct these days mm -hmm. outside of the laboratory. Mm -hmm. So um, at the moment, we've got some research technicians working with us, and part of their role is to actually identify freeware um, software Lovely. Okay. Um, that can be used uh, by students, by staff, mm -hmm. um, to conduct psychology-like experiments. And compared to where we were, say, 10 years ago, yeah. where if you wanted to design, say, an experimental task involving a, a specific type of, say, problem-solving apparatus, mm -hmm. you would have probably had to program that yourself using... Yeah. Something like Microsoft Visual Basic. Gotcha. Some of that. Whereas these days, um, I've got a number of students at the moment who, with all of their experimental tasks, mm. whether they're memory-based tasks, problem-solving tasks, they found them all on the internet right. uh, as freeware tasks they can use in their current form. They can manipulate and modify them mm -hmm. so they can make them do things that um, they might not have been able to do before. Mm -hmm. And they can actually collect real data. Right. Um, so one student, for example, at the moment is looking at um, problem-solving. Um, and he's identified some iPad um, applications of problem solving tasks. Right. And he's running his whole experiment on his iPad. Now, he didn't necessarily need the psychology laboratory to do that because he yeah. found all of those things himself. Mm. So um, there are lots and lots of bits of kit out there. Also, some of the software we use in psychology, although some of these things often come with licensing agreements and you have to pay for them. Sure. Um, some of the software suppliers... Uh, 
who develop some of these software do give you sort of a 30 and 60 day trial periods. Oh, right. Okay. Like working on them. So there's software packages such as um, they may uh, sound uh, uh, a little bit obscure at the moment, but things like Superlab, mm-hmm. um, E-Prime, which mm-hmm. is another very, very nice package for designing fairly simple and sophisticated experience. Yeah. The students can access for sort of 30 to 60 days even right. before they come into a psychology lab and access the full version. Gotcha. So suppose e, so if you've got, well, they may be potential students who are thinking, right, I'm, I'm doing my A-levels or you know, whatever at the moment, yeah. my Welsh back. I, I want to go and maybe do a psychology degree or something. Yeah. They can actually jump on the internet and have a play around with these things even before they kind of walk in Absolutely. The they can jump on the internet and they could think think to themselves, okay, I want to look at a particular area. I want to look at, say, a memory-based task because mm. I, I, I've heard that that's a popular area of study within psychology. And they, te- they, they would tend to be able to find hundreds of tasks available to them to help them understand the basics of a memory experiment. Right. And that applies to lots of other areas gotcha. as well. And um, is there... Is there almost like a central repository of these things or is it a case of kind of um, Googling stuff or are there like prime websites? Yeah, generally, that... um, if you look at different psychological resources, like the British Psychological Society mm. is the professional accrediting body for all accredited psychology degree courses within yeah. the UK. Um, and if you go on their website, there's often quite a few resources there. Gotcha. Also, the American Psychological Association, um, who are probably the biggest body when it comes to psychologists and professional psychology. On their websites, there's access to lots and lots of experimental tasks and resources that people can use. Right. Generally these days, as the internet, I suppose, tends to be these days, if you went to a normal, say, Google search engine yeah. and you typed in psychology mm-hmm. experiment um, and maybe typed in something a bit more specific if you wanted to look at memory, problem solving, attention, yeah. face recognition body image, those kind of things, um, you would tend to be able to find very quickly um, some kind of experimental task yeah. that you could use and be involved in. So, or, or questionnaires. It doesn't necessarily have to be tasks that are performed on computers. Mm. That's great, because it, it, it sounds like, it sounds like um, you know, until recently, perhaps the, the kind of psychology side of things was maybe a little bit of a, a closed book outside of higher education. Until you, until you actually came and did a course at A-level or, or whatever, you didn't have access to that stuff, but it sounds like it's really opened it, up. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the amount of information and resources that are available of increased dramatically over the last you know they have few increased, years yeah they increased uh, dramatically obviously with the proliferation and development of computer based technology and just to give an example i started out in a phd in 2001 and I needed a fairly simple problem-solving task in order to run my first package of experiments right. within psychology. And there was nothing available on that on the internet. So I had to sort of teach myself in six months how to how to program. I'm not very good at it. Um, I, I sort of regard myself as being at an intermediate level, but I had to program my experimental task myself. Mm. Uh, and now I have some students who are doing the same thing, and they found those tasks on the internet. Right. Um, so they haven't had to program them because at the end of the day, not all psychologists are computer scientists. They're not computer programmers, and not everybody who does psychology wants to be a computer no, programmer. No, absolutely. Um, but in the past, it's been the case that if you want to do quite specific experimental work, you've had to learn the basics of computer programming in order to do it. It's a very, very good skill to have. And, for example, myself, I'm, I'm really glad that I've got it. Um, but some people coming into a psychology degree, they don't have to be afraid mm. that they have to know how to do those things. Because quite often the tasks that are uh, that, 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 they, that they need to use for research can be available in quite a usable and really user friendly format. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, just from, from my experiences when I come, was applying to university, it seemed that the kind of folks who would necessarily go off and do computer science or mathematics or whatever weren't necessarily the same kind of folks that wanted to go off and do psychology. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's something we find here when we're working with students that a lot of the time we're asked to help them do things using the computers which will involve either mathematical uh, concepts or just graphing data and all that kind of stuff. And there, there is this kind of like sharp intake of breath because it's like, hang on a second, we're here to be, yeah. you know, psychologists or yeah. we're here to be, I don't know, um, sports coaches. We're not here to be yes. doing all that stuff. But, yeah. but I suppose in the past, you, you had to have those skills, whereas nowadays you can actually focus more on maybe analysing the data and Absolutely. drawing your own conclusions from it rather than, oh, okay, I've got to write the code first. And uh... Absolutely. I think you know, you, you've hit a very important nail on the head there because I think what happened in the past uh, within psychology from some personal experiences and wider experiences with other sort of past colleagues mm. is that you were often restricted in the past in, in terms of getting yourself going, uh, running all the experiments and studies that you wanted to run mm. because you had to try and learn how to do some of these things yourselves. And some people, no matter how much they teach themselves, yeah. They, they 
they just can't do it. They yeah. don't want to do it. They're sure. not sort of interested in doing yeah. it. Um, so having the support around of people who know what they're doing mm. and able to uh, find technological resources or develop the programs and software uh, for the needs uh, mm. of the students when they're performing the experiments is absolutely fantastic because it means we can do much more work we can do more interesting stuff. Mm. And also we can inform each other as well. So the technologists might be informed a little bit about psychology and vice versa. The psychologists do get informed by the, by the technologists doing it, which is great. I mean, that's the way it should be. Yeah. And you mentioned before that you've got uh, folks who are looking at kind of uh, freeware or, or, you know, open source kind of tools and software. Are there any particular ones that kind of spring to mind that have been or that have proved themselves to be particularly useful yeah, there are certain um, things that are uh, generally particularly useful. Um, the, the There are certain packages out there, for example, as I said, sort of Superlab and E-Prime, mm -hmm. which, uh, which are used to generate uh, very basic or sometimes quite sophisticated experiments. Yeah. So you can do things like uh, color matching tasks. Mm -hmm. You can do things like you, you can add images and sounds and videos to tasks oh, and right. manipulate all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, so so they, they are available as a sort of a temporary freeware mm -hmm. download. Um, there are also some packages out there. I forget the name of one of them at the moment, but there's a package out there where you can use a standard webcam right. um, on a computer um, to actually track your eye. So you can turn oh, your own webcam into an oh. eye tracker, <laughs> whereas some of the eye trackers that we use within psychology and outside of psychology, yeah. you know, the, the, the one we've got in the psychology lab at the, mom, at the moment costs £30,000, mm. and we all have to receive quite intensive training on that. Mm. Whereas if you wanted to do a very, very basic experiment sure. just to get an insight into where you're looking on a screen for example mm. you can now do that with your webcam for mm. free um so there's all sorts of things like that that are available and obviously questionnaire uh based software online questionnaires like mm -hmm. survey monkey and, yeah. and all the other things like that are making things increasingly uh better and easier uh for students of psychology and actual um, uh, uh, researchers within yes. psychology uh, to, to do more things. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've got a website that goes with the podcast. What we'll do is we'll put links to all the stuff that uh, you've mentioned. We'll so run far. some psychological experiments uh, <laughs> on Phil to get that memory out of his head, and we'll put the details up on the site. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so what about yourself? And what kind of um, are there any technologies or tools that you use on a kind of day to day basis that make your life? just that little bit easier um, um what i tend to use I, I, I try to use technology as much as i can mm. um uh, so i tend to use obviously uh within work computer pcs yeah sure um i i'm the kind of person who likes to have sort of access to lots of information mm. um but also not make it sort of too easy for myself that i'll forget things that i need to do yeah um so you know i'm i'm a firm believer in having lots of information available to you on a variety of mechanisms so or a variety of devices so computer screens uh I, 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 I don't yet have one, but I'm, I'm, I'm soon to invest in a sort of uh, tablet, okay. uh, sort of PC. Yep. Um, and quite often these days, you find a lot of researchers within psychology, rather than sort of confining themselves to a laboratory, mm. a lot of their experimental tasks are conducted on netbooks, yeah. um, iPads, tablets, and those kind of things. Mm. Um, and I can see a lot of mileage in that, and obviously your mobile phone devices and so on and so forth. Sure, on. sure. Um, so within psychology, I think some people might think that within psychology, you don't tend to need to use a lot of technology mm. in order to make psychological research possible. But you'd be surprised at how much, I guess, or some people would be surprised at how much available computer technology out there can be used right, okay. to actually conduct psychological research. Yeah. So you can, you can actually conduct some very, very meaningful psychology experiments on your mobile phone mm. these days. So you could do a problem solving task. You could do a memory test mm. on your mobile phone. Yeah. Because you've got access to the internet, you may have three G or whatever. Sure, um, and you can conduct experiments on your mobile phone or tablets. Fantastic. So, and so, uh, and and do many? So it's, it's certainly your students. Do, is that what they? Do a significant proportion of them do yeah. that, or they're starting to do it a lot more. Yeah, I, I would have said a few years back that most people, if they thought they were going to use computer technology within psychology, mm. then they would tend to think, okay, I need a computer within a laboratory yeah. or my home computer. Yeah. These days, you're seeing more and more students coming along to pretty much every research meeting we have with a tablet device, mm. um, and they 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 find their experimental tasks that they can use, and they put them on that tablet device, and then inevitably they end up testing many of their participants in experimental situations using that device so quite often these days it's becoming quite interesting for me when i'm marking students work mm. uh, a number of years ago you would have seen in the material section of, mm -hmm. a, of a say a scientific laboratory report um a pentium 2 pc was used connected yeah. to a 19 inch monitor and so on and so forth yeah these days i'm often giving people advice on how to describe their tablets 
in those material sections. Right. So, so what was it? What version was it? Mm. How did you use that bit of software? What size was the screen and so on? Because so, uh, so many more students are using mm. the technologies that I guess lots of people are using outside of the world of psychology sure. to, to conduct their research. Yeah. I mean, I know we, we, we did the IT inductions this year uh, as part of you know, what we do as, as, a, as a team. And this year was the first year where I kind of noted a significant number of the first years coming in were wielding smartphones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, it was, whereas before it was like a, a couple of them, this year it, you were actually, it was actually quite rare for students not to have yes. one. It was like, yeah. oh, oh, wow, okay, they've all got smartphones. Yes. Um, so, that, and in some cases, what they're carrying in, the, in their pocket, I guess, is sometimes more powerful Absolutely. than maybe some of the mm, kit that yeah. we've got within the university that's maybe kind of a couple of years old. You know? Absolutely. It, it, it is an amazing thing. And, and one thing uh, that I have noticed as well um, among students, very much like you said, is they are carrying mobile devices. And more and more, uh, they want to sort of connect with some of the technologies that we have within the university. Mm. So if I sort of give you one example of something we've developed quite recently, which is quite exciting within psychology, we've developed a new computer suite. Yeah. It's a faculty computer suite yeah. within uh, the Faculty of Education and Social Sciences, but it was developed mainly with sort of psychology in mind. Mm -hmm. And within this facility, we have sort of 40 plug and play laptops uh, that we Great. plug into a lap safe. Yeah. So it's a teaching environment, but we can turn it into a computer environment very, mm -hmm. very easily. And we're the first university within the UK to do it. We have a technology called Wow Vision. Mm -hmm. um, and Wow Vision is a sort of network streaming box yeah. that's connected uh, within um, uh, this, uh, this environment so that not only can the students sort of come in and pull a laptop out of a lap safe, which is fully charged, mm -hmm. and connect to this Wow Vision network remotely mm. and perform all sorts of tasks. It could be teaching. It could be, it could be research related. Yeah. They can use any of their internet enabled devices and also connect to the network for most. Brilliant. So they can come in with an iPad. They could come in with a smartphone. They mm -hmm. can come in with anything that can connect to the internet. And in three very easy steps, they can connect to the network and view the lecture materials on their phone. Wow. They can view the experiment that's being performed at the front of the class on their mm -hmm. phone. They can also do it outside of that environment. I think there's a sort of one or two mile radius um, if uh, connectivity mm. is good, where they could not necessarily have to be in the room. Mm. They could be in a computer suite and still access those kind of features. Mm. Uh, and within within that facility as well, we also have the um, the option of integrating the work that everybody's doing at the same time. So uh, as the lecturer, demonstrator, instructor, if you like, at the front of the room, yeah. we can have access to all 40 devices in the room or any mobile devices, and we can stream any of the information that's available on those devices to all sorts of screens within the room. So somebody yeah. could be working on something or on a phone, yeah. and they could come back to us and say, I would like all students to now see this, to see the progress that I've made on this. Mm -hmm. And we can actually... I'm going to use the word beam. Yep, that that's fine. No, yep, it's good. It, but we can actually beam that to all screens in the room. And then we can use some smart board pens and write all over it. And then yeah. we, can, we can sort of send it out to all students and save it. Uh, save it onto their laptops for them so they can take it away. Yeah. So a lot of technology is involved. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. And, and not, the most amazing thing, well, I mean, that's, that's amazing anyway. But the most amazing thing is that you know, no one else obviously is using this technology at we, the moment. Is that pretty much the well, case? I mean, it, or, it, or at least you were certainly the first. And I know, yes. I know your lab is, you know, it's it's not that old. It's fairly recent it's in terms recent. of setting things up. So it's yeah. quite amazing that that technology is is available. And it sounds so incredible for a student to have access to all that information. It's amazing that it isn't something that's absolutely perhaps um, you know as, as well used as it, as it perhaps it could be. Totally, we we, we presented we presented a case because that that uh, laboratory teaching facility was developed in the summer of two thousand and eleven. Mm. Uh, sorry, two thousand. 2012. Yeah. It was oh, developed in the yeah. summer of 2012. That facility it's was very developed. recent. Yeah. Uh, very, very recent. Um, but uh, the company were, were very interested in us having the technology because we presented a series of needs that we wanted and we didn't think there was anything out there that would answer those needs. Yeah. So we wanted a lot of interactivity within that room, a lot of wireless kind of streaming of lots mm -hmm. and lots of information. Yeah. And they came along with this, with, the, with, with this piece of technology, the Wow Vision Box, that answered all of those questions. Since we've had it uh, within our, our research teaching facility, um, a lot of other universities and businesses have started taking interest. Right, so right. we've been seen as a sort of prototype example at the moment, and the company are very, very keen um, for other people to come in and, and use the technology. So there are a number of universities at the moment who are visiting us mm. on a regular basis to come and see how it works. And quite a few of those look like they're going to adopt the same technology as well. So I guess... Um, it's nice for us to be able to say we're leading the way yeah, um, that's on that front. And have you had a lot, much feedback from students generally in terms of you know how they're finding it and how, how... the students are generally? I'd say ninety percent of the students are finding it. Um, they use the word sort of amazing to describe yeah. it. Mm. Very technological, very helpful. 
um, to have all these kind of things where not only do they have the normal materials they can take away from a lecture or an experiment, um, it's made a lot easier for them to interact. So, for example, you might have a quieter student who doesn't want to necessarily speak out in a class or even yeah. speak out in an experiment. You might be asking somebody in an experiment to verbalize their thoughts as they perform the experiment, how they're planning a the task, for example. It's much easier now for them to do that on a device um, electronically and, and sort of be mapped to the screens. Mm. Um, about 10% of the students are still sort of a bit computer shy. Mm -hmm. um, so they, you know, they do find it a little bit overwhelming. Mm. However, with the support of the team and yes. the, uh, the IT support that we have within the university, which is absolutely fantastic, all students within a very short period of time become very comfortable with that equipment and they start believing in themselves they start believing i can use this technology that's available to me that's excellent because because i mean certainly a buzz phrase that's around, around and has been for a while is kind of extra added value and you know in terms of going to university and getting a degree what's what's extra added value for me for the money i'm paying and that yes. and that certainly sounds like it's it's over and above the kind of extra added value that students would expect from it from is. their normal sort of university education it so. is. yeah I, I would totally agree with that and i think one thing is doing that i'm really excited about in uh, in particular is for those students uh, who are quite sort of computer shy, they're quite new to using computers. Yeah. Because it's made so easy for them to use it, those kind of fears and anxieties are sort of taken away at an early stage. And what we find with those students is they come along and say, we didn't expect to have this in the first place. And now not only are we using it, we're feeling so much more confident about using computer technology in general. Excellent. Because of using it, because it's not as scary as it used to be to do things mm -hmm. these days. You know, anybody can do it with a bit of practice and a bit of training and the right level of support. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You mentioned um, using the Wow Vision system, uh, students are able to access the content even if they're not physically in the room. In your experience, does that present a problem? Because, I mean, you know, in, in, in the past, I've had conversations with uh, academics and educators who uh, have a, a concern that if students are able to access the content without physically being in the classroom or the lecture theatre, they won't turn up. That's a really, really good point. And that's one that we made to uh, um, uh, when we were having the initial meetings regarding mm. this facility. So there are a number of things built into that to prevent students from hopefully taking that attitude, which we would hope that most people wouldn't. Sure. Um, but what we tend to use, we've got a lot of facilities in there that... That, that facility is only available if the instructor, if the instructor, lecturer, researcher uh, switches it on. Right. Basically. So say you were conducting a lecture, then you would have to put in a lot of passwords to actually get to the stage that anybody can access it from outside. Right. Okay. Unless you gave them specific instructions and key passwords to do it. Mm -hmm. Where it is beneficial is, say, for example, you were running an in-class experiment mm -hmm. and you wanted to collect a lot of data yeah. within that experiment, is that you could you could advertise that experiment to people outside of the classroom. You could say... You're in the if you're in the library at the moment, if you're in computer suites at the moment, mm -hmm. you can now pretty much live stream into this experiment and take part in it, and you don't yeah. have to be in the room. So for lectures, we tend not to use it too mm -hmm. much, yeah. um, unless, for example, let's say in adverse weather conditions, like we've had quite recently, in in sort of adverse weather conditions, we felt um, that we could use the technology to support students to still um, to still be sort of virtually present yeah. within that environment. We could then sort of stream things to them in, in, in different places. Because yeah. like I know that certainly with the, the psychology uh, groups that you teach, there is a there's quite an active student run Facebook yes. community. Yes. Um, and I'm and I'm I'm lucky enough to be part of that. They, they kind of brought yes. me in um, as ad hoc technical support. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was interesting um, last week. I mean, the reason why there wasn't a podcast this week is because of the snow and it all got you know cancelled yes. and stuff. But on, on those days when uh, the campuses were closed or or at risk of being closed, a, a lot of them were on Facebook. Going, oh man, I can't I can't get to Phil's lecture. Yes. What are we going to do? No were they problem. Phil specifically. Yes, they were. Yeah, you <laughs> you were named specifically. It was like I can't get to Phil's lecture. Is anyone going? Can anyone get me notes? And it, and then it it became rapidly apparent that other solutions were going to be available to them yes. for those people who you know, genuinely were snowed in or, yeah. or the kids, they had kids, they couldn't get in because the schools were shut or, absolutely. Um, you know, so, I, so it, it does, I mean, I've seen it from both sides, if, if you like. Yeah, uh, it does and, make sense. And, and I, I, I've heard a lot about the Facebook um, page, which is absolutely fantastic, mm. especially when students are in those kind of times of need when they're working, um, the, 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 the small hours on an assignment or on a research project. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very useful um, on, on that front and it's a very active community. And we're also developing at the moment, and I think it stemmed from that Facebook community, mm. 
there are a couple of students at the moment working on a psychology society, uh, which right. is stemmed from the Facebook yeah. activity because they've yeah. realized there are a lot of psychology students in Newport yeah. and they've all got a lot of shared interests, but they've mm. also got a lot of diverse things that they can bring to, mm. uh, to forums and chats that they're having. So um, this year we'll see the, the launch of the psychology society, Brilliant. which will inevitably also not just involve face-to-face -face meetings and society events mm. and going out and having fun and social events and those kind of things, but we'll probably see a lot more use of technology on that side. Mm as well for people to sort of interact and communicate with each other yeah because there is there does seem to be a very tangible sense of camaraderie between the between the students and yes. particularly yeah. again you know i mean because i'm i'm you know when they put something up it'll pop up on my facebook timeline but you'll you will get a healthy mix of oh there's a social thing should we yes. go to the pub but you'll also get oh i'm i'm stuck with I'm stuck with this piece of research. Has anyone got any tips for me? Or has anyone got any research papers they can maybe point me in the direction yes. to? Like, and, and they genuinely just, they just help each other out. It's, it's just really nice to see that. Um, so that you don't get this situation where maybe you have a student who might be, you know, a single parent, got a couple yeah. of kids, yeah. who feels isolated that they, that the or, you know, they, they want to come and see the lecturers, but they can only see them maybe, you know, once a week for yes. whatever reasons. Yeah. And it means they can just kind of reach out it, and, and get that support. It that's... is fantastic. And I think sort of, you know, back in the day when possibly we were doing degrees, we didn't have that kind of level. Of no, support. no, not at all. You'd be sitting there with a textbook and hoping you can find the answer and you might not have the resources available. Where, yeah. As you say, these days you could be stuck on something <clears throat> that is quite pinnacle mm. to an assignment, to doing well in an assignment. Mm. It could be using a piece of software to run a statistical analysis or mm. something like that. And you don't know the answer. You've got, you would have normally not had anybody to ask because it's, it's 11 o'clock in the night. The yeah. lecturers are not there. But to have, you know, uh, a community of, say, 20, 30 other people in mm. the same situation, to be able to say, I'm stuck at, at mm. a particular step. Yeah. What do I do? And to have somebody come back and say, you do this, but now can you help me as well? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. And the responses are, are almost within, there's like a 10 minute window. You can, you can yeah. almost set your watch by it. Somebody will go, yep, no problem. Yeah. Don't worry, I've got that. You know, yeah. it's, um... and it's, it, it can only be a good thing. And when I, when I first heard about the psychology um, Facebook page, I, I suppose uh, to, my initial reaction was, oh dear, what are they going to be saying about the lecturers? Um, Indeed. I mean, and that's yeah, a valid, cause, I mean, I was at um, University of Glamorgan two days ago and they, we were having a, a fairly kind of uh, theoretical discussion about the you know, use of Facebook. And that was one of their concerns yeah. that was raised. Well, the students can be bad mouthing us. But I was like, well, actually, in my experience, that's not the case. Not, not at all. And that's know? the feedback we're getting. Yeah. We tend to get that feedback. You know, they're, they're kind of drawing more upon like if I take myself as an example, there, there was a key thing that Phil said in one of the cognitive psychology lecture, lectures today. Can anybody remember what yes, that was? Yes. And they're coming back and saying, oh, it was that. And if you remember, he gave you an example of driving a car uh, in snowy conditions mm. or something like that. And they, that's the kind of feedback we're getting. So I think initially uh, alarm bells rang for me, but mm. they were quickly kind of dissipated by some of the some of the clearly good things yeah. uh, that were going on on those web pages. And as I said, are those hours of need mostly mm. as well? The night before an assignment has to be in, you've got... You got you know you, you you could ask your family members you could ask your husband your wife your girlfriend yeah. your boyfriend but they might not know the answer yeah. they might not be interested in psychology mm. so it's nice to have people out there who might know the answer and to feel like a community mm. and, yeah. an, an online community and to have that level of support it's yeah. really really good I think I think it's a brilliant thing yeah. what about yourself then are there any, uh, what what's your um... What you, are you researching anything at the moment? Yeah, um, um, I'm, I've, I've always been a very, very active researcher. So mm. I come from very much a research background. So mm. before joining the University of Wales Newport, my primary role was research. Mm. Um, so at the moment, um, I'm working on a couple of areas of research that are looking at things like human-computer interaction yeah. uh, and how we use psychological principles to inform better interaction with computers right, okay. and the development of computer technology to better work with humans, mm. if you like. Um, I've recently started working working on a research project that's funded by the engineering and physical, uh, uh, the EPSRC, an engineering mm -hmm. and physical sciences research uh, body, mm -hmm. uh, looking into um, aerospace uh, human-computer interaction problems. Right. Um, so we're, I'm working with colleagues at Cardiff University at the moment on that, mm. which is quite exciting, um, on a scoping project uh, to, uh, to look at computer technologies at, at the moment and to kind of project what they're going to be like in sort of five to ten years' time. Right, OK. And to develop more psychological principles through experimental research mm. on how better to how better to optimally design computer technologies with the user in mind in the future yeah um so we're working on those kind of things and there's lots of other exciting things going on as well and 
uh, within psychology, the whole the whole team of research, uh, the whole team of lecturers within mm. psychology are all active researchers. So we're all actively doing research on different subjects. And we do, we're starting to have as well, which is pretty exciting, a number of uh, paid and voluntary, but some paid research yeah. assistants and research technicians yeah. working with us. So the research community is quite vibrant. And we're mm. hoping that's going to grow through even more PhD students, research associates, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so it seems to be getting bigger and bigger. We're, we're almost outgrowing what we what we have at the moment. So we need to expand. Yeah, a bit. That's, <laughs> that, that's a challenge for the future. We we need a bit more space. Okay. So need... And if um, if people wanted to find out more about yourself and, and your work, is there uh, um, is there other places you, are you on Twitter or LinkedIn or? Um, uh, I'm not on Twitter you... at the moment. Okay. There's there's a, there's a reason for that. Okay. I guess <laughs> you guys are probably going to shout and sort of stare at me and say you no, should be we'll on mess Twitter. up the levels if we shout. But yeah, go. Um, uh, I, I, you can you can you can access um, my university profile mm-hmm. by doing a standard sort of Google or Yahoo search. Sure. Whatever yeah. You tend we'll to put use. a link to that. Up. Yeah. Um, and if you type in Philip Morgan Psychology Newport, you'll get to my university link. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason I'm not on Twitter at the moment, and mm. I know I'm going to cave in, and I'm going to give in, <laughs> and I am going to be on Twitter, is because one of my key areas of research um, involves the effects of interruptions and distractions mm-hmm. on performance in workplace settings. Yes. Uh, so I guess I'm trying to be stern on this front and mm-hmm. saying that the message I keep giving to people quite a lot is communicative technologies are very, very useful, mm. and they're, they're, they're really, really useful for a variety of sources. But I tend not to have them switched on when I'm doing work. Mm. So I've kind of tried not to not to use those kind of things myself but i, I can sort of see the benefits mm. i i am on facebook i do use facebook mm. chat but i only use it at periods where workload levels are lower yeah and gotcha so and so forth. i'm um, sure we can teach you how to uh, schedule your social media <laughs> that's probably what i need so rather than avoid them i need to schedule them and i think scheduling is yeah. a key word when yes. it comes to kind of manager in yes. managing useful distractions yeah i mean, soon as, I mean that's the kind of discipline that we've all had to learn and practice yeah. it's that kind of because otherwise we could just sit around on twitter all day it's like no, no, we, you, you can't do yes. that. So it's all, it goes in hand in hand, I suppose, with the email management in that many of us will go, right, I'm going to have an hour where I'm going to check my emails. But then after that hour is finished, Absolutely. I'm going to go and do something meaningful because I could just be yes. writing emails all day. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think we need to do that a lot more. And, and from the work, if anybody reads my work, if they go to my sort of web page, mm. they'll find that I often take quite a critical approach uh, to, to, to sort of technologies mm. and sort of making things too easy for users, um, if you like. But doing some of those things, scheduling, mm. making things a little bit harder sometimes, but easy on some fronts is kind of one of the approaches uh, that I take. Um, but if, if anybody wants to find out more about psychology research in general as well at the University of Wales, Newport, um, we've recently launched our psychology research cluster Web page, Brilliant. Okay. Which, if you go onto the University of Wales Newport website mm. uh, and type in psychology research cluster, you'll have access to pretty much everything that's going on in psychology on a research front. Wow. From the research publications we're involved in, the research projects, mm-hmm. uh, even more information on the facilities that I talked about as well. Mm. Um, and we keep populating that with information on a sort of week to week basis. Oh, so, it's, so it's quite up to date. So that's the psychology research cluster wow. web page at the University of Wales Newport. Brilliant. We will definitely put a link. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I, I think that's time to wrap up this week's podcast. Um, Phil has had to leave, so we'll, we'll kind of say a goodbye to Phil, even though he's not in the room, um, and essentially say thanks very much yet again to, to the guys in the studio for coming along and telling us some really useful um, bits and pieces about technologies that they've been using. Um, so thanks very much to, to Paul, yet again, and to Elizabeth, and a, a massive thank you from myself, and hopefully um, we'll catch you again on the next episode.